Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Small Business Insider Live, a live stream hosted by the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, specifically for business owners, entrepreneurs, and anybody interested in small business policy. My name is Christy Arslan, and I am SB Council's Entrepreneur in Residence. I'm also a small business owner located in Alexandria, Virginia. Today, we have joining me Chief Economist for SB Council, Ray Keating. And he is also the author of many books, but one in particular for the subject we're talking about today, entitled Unleashing Small Business Through IP, The Role of Intellectual Property in Driving Entrepreneurship, Innovation, and Investment. Hi, Ray, thanks for joining us. Hey, Christy, how are you? Doing well. So we, I know there's a lot going on on Capitol Hill right now um, and in the news, but we wanted to take some time to talk about intellectual property because there was a, a recent executive order by President Trump which mentioned it. But before we get into all of the policy and the and the interesting stuff, um, I was hoping that you could take some time to talk a little bit more about IP. Intellectual property is such a big term, and I think many small business owners have some misconceptions about it. And and so um, I'd love if you could better define intellectual property and why it should matter to small businesses. Sure. Um, you know, what we're talking about are private property rights, just with tangible property, except now with intellectual or intangible property. So, you know, the property owner has the right to possess and use and trade and um, uh, the property. You, you have legal protections against people trying to take your property. Um, and as I said, you can trade or transfer it because you're the owner. So that goes for physical property. It goes for intellectual property. And what we're talking about here are um, creative works, if you will. So uh, inventions, which are protected by patents. Um, also trademarks, which are pretty self-explanatory. And then, uh, you know, you have copyright, which includes, you know, literary works, uh, you know, music, art, artistic works, um, drawings, paintings, photographs, etc. So that's the the broad world of intellectual property. Uh, and it's it's critical for small businesses to be tuned into this and to make sure that they're they're using the system, if you will, you know, the patent system, copyrights, trademarks, because you know, obviously they don't have a legal department down the hall <laughs> like yeah. a big business does. So they really need to be uh, tuned into what's available to them. Um, on this front and utilizing everything that's there for them. Now, I have a little bit of a personal story about IP that I wanted to share because I think a lot of small businesses think, oh, it's just, you know, tech companies or, you know, that have to be worried about intellectual property or concerned about it or, you know, those who have invented something um, or a particular product. But, you know, we own a gourmet popcorn company here now. Alexandria, and we went through the process, though costly, to trademark our name and our logo. And lo and behold, you know, about two years into our business, someone tried to start a business with a name almost exactly like ours, um, same type of business in a different state. And because we were, you know, we went through that process of protecting our our trademark, we were able to address that situation and not have a competitor using something so similar to ours. So it ended up being a big benefit for our little gourmet popcorn business. But I so big and businesses, big and small, and different types of businesses should really look into this. So for small businesses who have IP, what are some of the benefits of going through the process of protecting it? And what are some of the challenges? Well, you just summarized that perfectly. <laughs> you know, the benefits are that you can protect your business, things that are essential, vital to your business, central to your business. So um, the benefits are, are substantial. You know, obviously, if you go beyond your situation, which again is a perfect example, but if you invented something, um, you know, you're you're producing music, you're writing a book, and so on. So you need to utilize all these tools at your disposal in order to, you know, protect your your creations, protect mm -hmm. your business. Now there, again, you mentioned there was a cost involved, and there mm -hmm. are costs, and and you can see people saying, well, you know, is it really worth it? Um, you know, I've got to spend money on other things, advertising, marketing, and so on. Um, it is worth it, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, somebody comes in and steals your intellectual property today, depending on, you know, the industry, the business you're in, 
but pretty much that's stealing your business. So yeah. I, I think it's it's an investment. It's you, know, you have to look at certain things as investments. Other things are those annoying costs. This is clearly an, an investment. So you have to be um, you have to be smart about it to protect your business over the long run. Is it harder? I mean, we are in a global economy, whether we like it or not. So, um, you know, I can imagine that a company, particularly with certain types of IP, maybe like tech or or those who have products and inventions, can probably likely face higher challenges. You know, since we are in a global economy, you know, what are what are some of the things that small businesses do or face um, with those types of products? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The international arena presents a lot, many more challenges, and we can talk a little bit about that in terms of what Congress and our elected officials need to do. But, um, you know, for example, if, if you have a patent on a product in the United States, that doesn't mean that patent holds in any other country. So you have to be aware of that. So you have to go for patent protection in each country. Um, and when you look at the industries that are really IP intensive, you know, we, the book, let me hold up prop time. See, there's our book. <laughs> um, <laughs> We have individual chapters on a whole host of industries that are very IP intensive. So you have software, you have pharmaceuticals, obviously movies, uh, music, television, book publishing, um, uh, video games. And then we get into other industries that you wouldn't think are IP intensive, but are. Um, you know, you mentioned trademarks and things like that. So and we break down those industries and show how many are small businesses. So, mm -hmm. again, these are very international industries. Um, you want to reach out, right? Today's marketplace, it's not a, uh, you're going into the international arena to, to, um, to, for opportunity, right? You see the, the market that you can reach there. Um, so there's a reason you're doing it, but you just have to be realistic about, again, what do I need to do to protect my intellectual property? And that can be, obviously it's, it's costly, if you will, at home, it gets more costly once you go into the international arena, but you have to be aware of it. There are stories in our book of people that thought they covered themselves and they didn't, uh, and they wound up losing out uh, in the international marketplace. And then there's the flip side of counterfeiters from in other countries sending products here that are knockoffs of your goods. Um, and again, you don't have to be a big business to suffer that. Again, many small businesses have, and, and some of them unfortunately have been driven out of business because of it. Well, perfect. Yeah discussion about what's going on in Congress and in the administration. Um, recently, SB Council joined some other organizations and think tanks to send an open letter to Congress and the Trump administration to provide some insight on guidelines um, around intellectual property when they're reviewing regulations or laws on this issue. So what are some of the key key issues facing Congress and the Trump administration around IP as it relates to small business? Yeah, there's a lot there. That letter was was kind of the broad, you know, provide, set up a foundation about, you know, um, why intellectual property and protections matter, their importance, the background, you know, where does it come from in terms of going you know, back to the U.S. Constitution, um, free speech, protecting consumers from from knockoffs and dangerous products. I mean, think about, you know, pharmaceutical, that's a prime example where when you have counterfeits there, that literally becomes a life and death situation. Um, you know, so IP rights on the internet, which is a tremendous challenge, obviously, but it's not just because it's a challenge doesn't mean that we shouldn't be, you know, making sure that uh, we establish strong property, uh, intellectual property protections uh, online. So there's a lot. I think that letter was great in terms of laying that foundation. They mentioned trade agreements. Um, mm -hmm. That's when we talk about the international arena, that's where uh, we have the opportunity to strengthen international, uh, uh, sorry, strengthen intellectual property rights on the international front, and that's that's critical. Um, so there's a lot of debate about trade right now, but we need to understand that free trade is not just about lowering tariffs and and getting rid of quotas and things, but but protecting intellectual property rights in the uh, in the uh, global marketplace. So that's critical. The uh, the executive order that. That President Trump signed had to do with that on the counterfeit side of things. So uh, it, basically, he was there. The order uh, when it deals with intellectual property rights is focused on 
beefing up protections uh, regarding counterfeit goods coming into the country, which is critical, and, and getting the, the IP holders, the, the rights holders involved in that process. Um, so that's certainly a positive. Um, there are other things going on in Congress. Uh, you know, it's interesting, we, we're, we're used to uh, judiciary matters being very split right now, obviously, with the Senate, uh, but there's uh, the House Judiciary Committee passed, just passed a, uh, a measure. Let me get it straight, because I'm, I'm a Register of Copyright Selection and Accountability Act. Mm -hmm. uh, but that passed 27 to 1, and that what that does is that it takes, it, it makes the head of the Copyright Office a presidential appointment. Um, which I think is a good, re good for several reasons, but obviously, number one is it recognizes the importance of intellectual property in our economy now. You know, understand that IP intensive industries make up about thirty eight percent of the U.S. economy today. Mm -hmm. So it 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 raises the level, but it also creates some benefits in terms of it being a presidential appointment, having to do with its rulings and and holding up in court and so on. So it, it would. You know, Congress and the Librarian of Congress. Librarian of Congress actually appoints that position now. So members of Congress, library, uh, Librarian of Congress would uh, would offer some uh, nominees to the president. The president would select someone, and then it would be that person would be subject to Senate confirmation. So it's that again uh, is a good step forward. There's another one, a bill over in the Senate um, that uh, would beef up education efforts for small businesses. Um, let me get the Small Business Innovation and Protection Act, um, where it would have the SBA and the Patent Office more, work more closely together to let small businesses know how important this is and how they can go about, for example, protecting their inventions uh, through the patent system. That's great. Um, it would, you know, any help would be great because it is a complicated process. And I know a lot of business owners don't know the steps or the expectations as you go through that, whether it be for something as small as, you know, a trademark or logo name to something as big as tech, you know, or a product. So I think got, that, yeah, let me let me point out we've and we've got a little one of the chapters in our book. Just it doesn't walk you through the whole process, but it points you to the right direction. So it points you to the copyright office. It points you to the patent office, um, just to you know get people. Okay, how do I how do I deal with this? And uh, it points them in that direction. So uh, hopefully that can be some help to people. And again, just for those participants watching us, the book that Ray mentioned again, Unleashing Small Business Through IP, is a free book actually, accessible on SB Council's website, sbcouncil.org. So feel free to visit the website and um, you know type in intellectual property in the search function, and it pops up along with some additional information regarding the open letter to Congress and administration and other great information around IP issues. We talked, Ray, about IP in regards to um, protecting, you know, your IP, but I know a uh, important component is the investment component. So another area where intellectual property is so important for small business is the ability to leverage it for investing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's that's crucial. Um, when you're uh, going, to, you know, businesses get certain state, whatever stage you're at, maybe an angel investment, venture capital investment, but you got to have those IP protections in place if you want to raise funds. I always, when I used to teach MBA students, we talk about this, and I would use um, the television show Shark Tank. And yeah. if you ever watch Shark Tank, when anytime they they come up with something that's somewhat novel, somebody's always asking, "Do you have a patent? What's the intellectual property on this?" Yeah. And that's right. It's it's one yeah. of the, there are questions, certain questions that come up with that. They they focus on who the person is, you know, uh, what obviously the product and service is, but also do you have do you have your IP protections in place? So that's critical. Um, again, because if you don't have it, who's going to take that? You know, investing. Listen, starting up a business is a is a risky endeavor, as you well know, uh, as entrepreneurs know. But investing in those businesses is also a high risk endeavor. You know, there's there's a big failure rate. You certainly want to have all your ducks in a row in terms of protecting your IP when mm -hmm. you're going out to funders. If you don't, you're just not going to be funded. So that's yeah. that, it's a critical issue. And and the same goes not just for for angel investors and and VCs, but also if you go to the bank for a loan and so on. Um, those those are critical things that that you have to have. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and I can tell you, you know, we started our business with an SBA loan and the our SBA lender, the bank, did ask us about whether we officially trademarked our logo, our name and, and you know, product name. So that does come up when you, even with an SBA loan process, when you're going to seek funding from traditional lending resources, in addition to, you know, uh, investment resources like angel investing, venture capital, um, it does come up. So it's important to look into that. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to be you don't want to be surprised by any of this. Obviously, when you go through this process, and that just makes obviously you look. If you don't have those things lined up, then obviously the investors, the lenders are going to say, you know, if you don't have this, how you know how can we expect to to uh, to take some risk with you? It's just not going to happen. Yeah, and I think especially for businesses who. Um, have a plan for growth, so are looking to grow, whether it be um, with products or more locations or maybe venturing into franchising, um, intellectual property becomes very important, don't you think? No, you're absolutely right. And, and again, it, don't think, you know, again, in our book, for example, we have these, these industries highlighted and those are the ones that people think of, but, you know, it's not limited in that sense you know, in terms of IP protections, because, um, you know, whether you're a manufacturer, whether you own a food truck, um, you've got to make sure that you're protected on all fronts. You don't want anybody to be able to come in and undercut your business because you didn't take the, the proper protections. So it's not just the software business. It's not just uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, it really goes down the line. And that's, that's one of the things, you know, the economists in me talking about how much IP intensive industries matter. Um, that's a conservative estimate, you know, when we look at our overall economy, because so many other industries aren't IP intensive, but they rely on intellectual property protections. I mean, that's the bottom line. So it's it's it cuts largely across the entire economy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, I think businesses are so accessible these days because of the Internet, the global economy. You can have somebody in a different country, you know, checking out your local shop or your local business, model, you know, via the Internet. And, um, you know, again, you want to take a look at what you can do to pr protect your idea. Yeah, and that's well, it's one other thing that, you know, a lot of companies look to China, for example, as a, an opportunity in terms of the size of the market and how it's growing. I mean, you know, they're still a developing country, but when you talk about their middle class, their middle class, because there's so many people there, is about the size of the United States. So there's a tremendous opportunity there to sell them goods and services. And also obviously a lot of uh, companies use Chinese manufacturers due to lower costs. Mm -hmm. That's great, but you've got to weigh the fact that China has Quite frankly, there's no other way to put it. Terrible intellectual property protections. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an on, it's an ongoing problem. Uh, they keep the government there keeps saying nice things uh, that they're they're doing better and and I you know I guess you could say they've done better than they have in the past, mm -hmm. but they've got a long way to go. Um, a lot of the horror stories that you hear tend to be related to oh yeah I went to China to you know produce my product and all of a sudden somebody else in China was producing my product that had nothing to do with me. So it's a it's one of those things that you have to weigh. Again, you have to go in and make sure you have all your, your ducks in a row in terms of IP protections. Make sure you have, you know, an agreement going in to talk to somebody that this is private, you know, mm -hmm. that you can't go anywhere else with this. And so, you know, all those things. But uh, it's it's a it's a difficult thing to weigh, so, and and it's not just small businesses, large businesses. You know, there are some large businesses that, that have just, you know, see the opportunity in China and take advantage of it. Others have walked away mm -hmm. because the poor IP protection. So when you're going, I think that's another thing. When you go international and you're looking for somebody to, you know, do some production for you, whether it be China or Vietnam, which is on the rise mm -hmm. uh, on that front, you have to make sure you um, you trust who you're working with. Yeah. So one of the things you mentioned is, uh, you know, or we highlight in the book is about innovation and how intellectual property can drive innovation. What what else can be done? What what else can Congress or the administration do to create a environment that um, is effective at protecting intellectual property and stimulate that innovation? Yeah, well, it's, you know, you go down the line, you know, the counterfeits issue is 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 critical. Um, the uh, beefing up in terms of, you know, the internet, intellectual property on the internet gets real funky because people have all sorts of kind of weird views that, 
you know, there are, there are some uh, of our, my, our libertarian brothers and sisters who kind of uh, delve into this idea that we don't need to protect into that intellectual property, that people are going to do things anyway and everything will be great. Well, it, it doesn't work that way. Anybody, in the, I think, in the business world pretty much understands that, again, I'm going to make the investment, uh, my own money to start up a business uh, based on this great IP that I have. I want to get investors. So, you know, what we just talked about before, you've got to have those intellectual property protections. So Congress um, needs to continually look at and quite frankly, update uh, the laws to reflect what's going on online. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, modernizing patents uh, more than we've done with, you know, we, we had a recent patent reform measure, which aligned us more with international norms, which is a positive step forward. But again, there's issues of patent trolls and, and things like that that have to be dealt with. That that's when you get into those, it gets kind of mind numbing in a certain yeah. sense. But yeah. Congress needs to be looking at that. And then again, so much of it with the global arena comes back to that trade factor. And and I, you know there is one of the problems with kind of stepping back a bit on the trade front, which certainly the Obama administration did. They they weren't out front. They eventually came around and. Got so, you know got a few agreements that were passed in, in the Bush administration through, and then they were talking about TPP, and we all know the story with that now. But when we when we kind of sit on the sidelines, other countries are moving ahead with trade agreements. Doesn't you know that's still the reality of it, and part of that are uh, our intellectual property protections, and and we're our companies are at disadvantage, our entrepreneurs are at a disadvantage if we're not you know, moving ahead with those agreements and getting those IP protections as well. So that's that's a critical issue that I think is going to be very, you know, very interesting, going to be very interesting to see where this all goes um, with discussions about, you know, NAFTA and so on and so on. I think that's an important point. Um, it's one thing that I hadn't thought of about the importance of rates for banks and how, you know, it's not just about uh, opening opportunities for businesses in both countries, but also um, deals with things like intellectual property and protections and whatnot. So I think that's a good point for small business owners to understand about trade and trade agreements, uh, you know, as that's going to be a topic of discussion in the near future. And we know that the president is meeting with uh, China's premier. So maybe one of the topics of conversation will be around things like intellectual property rights. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, how President Trump handles that because, you know, there, there is a, you know, the bottom, you, you can't get around it. It's a very, it's a substantial issue. It's a substantial problem. You know, as an economist, you know, my argument would be we need to communicate to the Chinese that it's not just about our goods and services that need to be protected, but if you want to make the leap uh, ahead with your own economy mm -hmm. beyond the low cost manufacturer economy, which is where China has been for a while, right? Um, I won't get into the, the whole issue about Communist Party running things, you know, but they've got to realize that if you put in these IP protections in a serious substantive way and actually carry through on what you're going to say, you know, what needs to be done, that's going to benefit your economy. That's going to benefit entrepreneurs. That's going to incentivize people in China to move ahead and, and create and innovate and do all those things that you need for an economy to take the next step up from a from a low cost manufacturer. So that's the key is to communicate the benefits to them in doing this. Sure, it's good for us, but it's good for you guys too. Well, Ray, thank you so much for all of your insight. Uh, if you have the book and want to show it again, please do. It's um, yes. it's unleashing yes. small business through IP: the role of intellectual property in driving entrepreneurship, innovation, and investment. If, as you said, you can get it free on the website in PDF form. If you like it like this, you can go over to Amazon. It is available on Amazon. And you can also get the Kindle version at Amazon. So there you go. Great. Thank you so much. Again, thanks, everybody, for participating with us today in Small Business Insider Live, a live stream hosted by the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. We are a nonprofit organization specifically for small business owners and entrepreneurs. We encourage you to visit us at sbcouncil.org. 
sign up for our e-news to get the latest uh, new, latest up-to-date insight on what's going on on Capitol Hill, what legislation and policies coming down the pike or regulations that might impact your business. Also consider joining SB Council. It's a fantastic organization that champions small business issues and is a great advocate for all of us on Capitol Hill and in the administration. So consider taking the leap and joining. Uh, we'd love to have you. Also, you can follow us on social media at SB Council, and we host Small Business Insider Live every Thursday at 1.30, so we hope to see you here next week. Thanks again, Ray. All right, take care, Christy. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.